In the middle of World War II, the Germans, led by Hitler, were taking over a lot of Europe. They were capturing soldiers from one country and holding them as prisoners of war in another. However, because the camps were not secure, many of these prisoners managed to escape. Hitler was enraged and ordered his men to construct a more sophisticated prison to prevent prisoners from escaping. That was how Stalag Luft III was built. It was a fortified prison that no one could escape from. But this didn't stop one man from trying to escape. He saw an opportunity to escape and decided not to go alone. He had other plans to set over 200 soldiers free. But how could this be possible in this iron city? This is the insane story of how 76 soldiers escaped from one of the toughest prisons in the world. In 1943, the Second World War was at its peak, the biggest armed conflict in history that continued for six years. During these six years, Germany, led by Hitler, invaded most of Europe, arresting many soldiers who were considered prisoners of war. There were huge concentration camps that were constantly being established to house these prisoners. The majority of the prisoners were always trying to escape, and most of their attempts were successful because they were not in real prisons. They were just concentration camps made of military barracks, and they were not cement buildings with cells and iron bars. So, many of these prisoners were escaping, but in the end, most of them were arrested again. The Germans, under Hitler's instructions, built more professional concentration camps and detention camps specifically to prevent these prisoners from escaping. So, they used to put prisoners who had tried to escape before in these camps. The most famous prison in these camps was called Stalag Luft III. This prison camp was designed in a way that made it impossible to escape. It consisted of military barracks that were placed on sturdy stilts that were raised from the ground by cement pillars. So it was almost impossible to dig an underground tunnel hole because it would be exposed immediately. Moreover, the soil in the prison was very soft, closer to sand, and if you tried to dig a hole in it, it would most likely collapse quickly. Besides, there were microphones planted in the ground to detect any possible digging sounds. The detention camp was surrounded by two fences reinforced with barbed wire, around which there were watchtowers where security guards monitored the place for 24 hours. It was almost impossible for anyone to escape from this prison, but there was a man in this camp, a prisoner who not only had enough will and determination to penetrate the prison's walls and break out at any cost, but he also planned to escape with hundreds of prisoners. This man was named Roger Bushell, and he was one of the British Air Force pilots. During the war, he took off his plane with his Air Force to carry out a mission in France against Germany, but his plane was shot down. He used his parachute to get out of it before it fell, and then he was arrested by the German forces. But this man, whenever he was put in a camp, used to escape, and then he got arrested again. He was able to escape more than once. However, one escape attempt caused him more problems than others. It was the time when he escaped with one of his colleagues while being transported by train. His colleague was a soldier from Czechoslovakia, so their goal was to go to Czechoslovakia and hide there. Czech at that time was under German occupation, and when they reached Czech, Roger Bushel and his friend were able to find shelter and hide at one of the local families. The family was sympathetic to them. They took care of them and kept hiding them from the German soldiers. The problem was that at that time in Czech, one of the biggest German commanders was assassinated, which prompted the German army to start a wide search campaign in Czech. They used to arrest everyone they suspected or even execute him immediately. When the German soldiers started to search the area where the family was, Roger Bushel and his friend decided to go out so that they wouldn't expose the family to danger. But this escape didn't last long, and they were caught immediately. Although Roger and his friend never admitted the family or the people who helped them, it seems that the neighbors of this family had snitched on them for fear of being punished. So the German soldiers executed all the members of this family, which caused Roger Bushel trauma and prompted him to hold grudges and hatred against the Nazis more than ever before. So he had a strong desire and will to destroy the German regime by any means possible. The problem was that the Germans put him in this prison camp, Stalag Luft III. The prison was constructed on the Polish lands, which were still occupied by Germany at the time. And as I told you, this prison was established to gather prisoners of war who tried to escape before. So it was the most fortified prison among all prisons. 
However, this didn't stop Roger from trying to escape. And as soon as he arrived, he started thinking about how he could escape from this place. Firstly, he started making relationships and friendships with other prisoners and getting to know them. Then he was able to form a special team of a small group of prisoners, maybe five or six. We will call this team the Command Council. This team's task was to smuggle as many prisoners as possible from the prison. Roger's main goal of this operation was to destabilize German power because the escape of hundreds of enemy soldiers inside the occupied territories would lead to the dispersion of the Germans, especially since most of these soldiers were experienced and of high ranks. So the Germans would fear that these soldiers would cause them troubles. As their strength, instead of being directed and concentrated to the front lines, a large part of it would be distracted to deal with the calamity that is happening inside. The goal was clear. Only a meticulous plan was left to execute this operation. The only way they had was to dig a tunnel to get out of this place. But the problem was the fortifications and security procedures we had mentioned before, besides the fact that the digging method is the most expected way to escape. So the guards were alert for such a thing, and they were always looking for any possible tunnels that the prisoners might have been digging. And here came Roger's smart idea. Instead of digging one tunnel, they would be digging three tunnels in different places in the prison. The idea behind this was that if the guards discovered one tunnel, most likely they wouldn't think that there were other tunnels at the same level that were being dug at the same time. The problem was that the guards in this prison were not ordinary guards. They were special forces soldiers who were dubbed the Mongooses. These soldiers were here on Hitler's orders. They were trained in a special way and experienced in dealing with such prison camps. And the discovery of escape attempts was their specialty. The command council, Roger Bushel and his friends were facing a very difficult opponent. And the confidentiality of this operation was their highest priority. And in order to preserve it, the first thing they decided was to name the tunnels that they were going to dig by ordinary people's names. They called the first tunnel Tom, the second David, and the third Harry. So when they talk to each other about the tunnels, they use these names, for example. They say, we will go to Harry at night, or Tom is in a good mood, or how is David doing? This way their conversations became encrypted, and if someone heard them, he wouldn't understand that they were talking about tunnels. Especially that one of the main strategies used by guards in prison was to plant a spy among the prisoners. Someone who pretends to be a prisoner but in fact is a guard's informant. These are usually new detainees or those transferred from another prison. The old prisoners had a smart and effective strategy to identify the spies who were planted among them by the guards. Briefly, their strategy was as follows. When a new prisoner arrives, they sit and talk to him, and they ask him how he was arrested and where he came from. For example, if he says, I'm from London, the prisoners bring one of the old prisoners they trust who is also from London. So this old prisoner starts asking the new prisoner about London, its weather, its the people, the places, and where he used to live exactly. Questions that no one will be able to answer unless he is really from London. So it was almost like a friendly interview that would help them identify whether this new prisoner was a real soldier or a spy of the guards who were planted among them. And if they discovered that a person was a spy, they would inform the guards and tell them that they knew that this person was not a real soldier and that he was one of their informants, and then they gave them the choice. Either they take him out of that place or they won't be able to guarantee his safety. The strange thing is that this strategy always works, and it reveals any informant trying to hide among them. This was essential for the plan to work because Roger wanted to smuggle hundreds of prisoners, so he had to make sure that there were no spies among them. Otherwise, everything would be ruined. Imagine that this prison camp was housing about 600 prisoners. Roger wanted to smuggle at least 200. Managing a huge escape operation like this was definitely a very difficult mission. Roger and his friends in the command council were the only ones who knew the details of the plan, as were the prisoners who participated with them. Each group knew a certain thing as much as they needed. They did not know everything about the plan. For example, one group only knew about the tunnel, Harry. Another group only knew about David. Another group only knew about Tom. Only knew the fourth group's task was to provide the equipment. 
The fifth group was in charge of getting rid of the dirt, and so on. Each prisoner has a mission and knows nothing else but his mission. For their movements to remain secret, the command council knew that they had to create a special spy network. A network that monitors the guards and knows their places and their movements at all times. So what did they do? They spread a group of prisoners in different parts of the prison, strategic places that allowed them to focus on monitoring the guards. For example, if they had a specific site they were working on, and they did not want the guards to see it, when the guard approached a certain distance from the site, one of the prisoners, for example, turned the cap on his head. The prisoner in the second position saw it and began to stretch. The third sees this prisoner who is stretching and begins scratching his arm. In this way, each of these prisoners who were monitoring the guards transmits a signal or message to the prisoner after him. These movements were encrypted messages that were sent to the place that they did not want the guards to see, so they could stop what they were doing in that place immediately, whether they were digging, getting rid of dirt, or making equipment. The smartest part of this plan was that none of these prisoners knew about the other, or what the signal he had been transmitting meant. This was the smart plan that the command council followed to keep the operation secret. Even those who participated in it did not know exactly what was happening. Now let's focus on the digging process itself. The first problem that they faced was the softness of the ground soil that the prison was built on. It was closer to sand, so these tunnels that they were going to dig needed support so as not to collapse. The solution was to extract and cut wooden boards from the prison's beds. Okay, let's suppose that they got the wooden boards. How will they place them in the tunnel? Where will they get the hammers and iron nails from? But wait a minute. They wouldn't be able to use the hammers or the iron nails even if they had them. Because the sounds of the hammer would be loud, there is a high probability that they would be detected by the microphones planted under the ground. So they had to invent a very smart engineering system to make these boards overlap each other. So they cut these boards in a way and made them look like cubes that are attached to each other. So if they gather these pieces, they will reinforce each other, bring back the tunnel, and prevent its collapse. However, they had to be very careful in dealing with it because a simple movement would make all the pieces or a large group of them fall. There is another question. How did they cut these wooden boards from the beds of the prison? And how did they make the shape that they wanted? The shape of the cubes that are attached to each other. The prisoners had in these cells what are known as gramophones, which are old record players. They were allowed to play music in their cells. These recorders had a metal spring inside, and if you took it out and made it straight, it would be very strong and sharp, as if it were a saw. These are the tools that the prisoners used to cut the wooden boards of their beds. After all the tools needed were at their disposal, all that was left for Roger and his friends was to keep digging the tunnels. But these tunnels had to be very deep, because if they were close to the roof, the microphones would probably detect the digging sound. Imagine digging tunnels with about 10 meters of depth. It was difficult but necessary because they had to make sure that it was far from the microphones. After they reach this depth, they have to dig towards the outside and cross the prison walls. And they even have to dig as far as possible so the tunnel exit would be in the forest among the trees. These tunnels might need to be extended to 100 meters or more. Can you imagine how difficult it is to dig this distance in these conditions and with these tools? What made the process even harder and more complicated was that they had to dig three tunnels with the same standards. Fortunately, having many prisoners involved in this plan helped them. The next problem they faced was the sand itself. They had to get rid of it without attracting suspicion. The prisoners used to take the sand in bags and put it in their pants, go out and throw them in the vegetable gardens they had in prison. But do you know what's more important than all this? The most important thing was the entrances to the tunnels. They were only known by the command council and the prisoners who were responsible for digging and reinforcing the tunnels. These entrances had to remain secret, because if they were discovered, the whole plan would fail. So, where were the entrances to these tunnels? As mentioned before, the prison huts were raised from the ground and placed on cement pillars, meaning that the ground was seen by everyone. So how could they dig in the ground without making the tunnel entrances visible? The tunnel entrances were in the cement pillars themselves. 
These pillars were used to extend the underground waterways and power lines. Some of these pillars were bigger than others. Depending on the size of the extensions that had to be passed through, the first entrance was for Tunnel Harry. It was under a heating stove in one of the huts. Each hut had a heating stove that was placed on top of a ceramic plate because the stove is made of metal and hot, so it couldn't be on top of the hut's wooden ground. The nice coincidence is that the stove was placed directly on top of one of the cement pillars. So the prisoners lifted the stove with the ceramic plate and started digging below the cement pillar. This is how they used to dig into the cement pillar directly. The entrance cover was the stove itself. So the guards weren't going to suspect the stove because they were the ones who placed it there. As for the second tunnel, David, it was in a shower drain. They dug directly through this drain. You may be wondering how they covered it. One of the members of the command council was a very smart engineer. He was able to make cement from dirt and simple materials. Cement's color looked like the floor of the drain. He was able to make a cement tile to the exact size of the hole they opened, which was originally a carefully drilled hole to be square. A very smart entrance. The third entrance was for the Tunnel Tom. It was similar to the entrance of Tunnel Harry. It was also under a heating stove in another hut. But this entrance wasn't on a ceramic plate like the first one. It was on a cement plate. And when the prisoners tried to lift the stove, this plate started to crack. It may not seem like a big problem. They could simply go to another stove in another hut. But they couldn't. Most of the stoves weren't under the cement pillars, and they needed to dig into these pillars to hide the entrance. So, what did the engineer do? He made a new cement plate to put under this stove and reinforced it with a wooden frame. And even if the guards saw it, they wouldn't suspect it. The prisoners were able to lift the stove while it was working, and some of them would go down to work on the tunnel, and the ones above would close the entrance behind them, and the stove looked normal without any suspicions. This situation remained for several months, and everything was going well in the three tunnels. But one day, the guards were making a routine inspection tour, and they entered to search the hut where the Tom Tunnel's entrance was. The entrance was under the stove, under which was the cement plate made by the engineer. By chance, one of the guards was carrying a stick, and this stick fell from his hand next to the stove on the cement plate. The stick hit the cement very hard, and it made it crumble a little bit. So the guard went down to see what that was, and here he alerted the other guard. They moved the stove from its place and discovered Tom Tunnel's entrance. After the guards had discovered the tunnel, the hut was evacuated. They planted explosives along the tunnel and blew it up. This is when the great benefit of the first original idea proposed by Roger Bushel appeared, which was digging three tunnels instead of one. When the Germans saw the great effort that was put into building Tom's tunnel, they didn't think that there might be two other tunnels of the same complexity, level, and size that were dug in other places in the prison. They immediately assumed that all the effort, work, and equipment were put into this tunnel that they blew up. On the contrary, instead of tightening the surveillance, they became more relieved, so the prisoners were happy about this. However, another problem appeared. The Germans decided to expand the prison camp from the side where David's tunnel was being dug, so this expansion ruined the exit that they were hoping to reach. They were hoping that David's tunnel would go from under the walls of the prison to the nearby forest. However, due to the expansion, the Germans started cutting down many trees from that side, which ruined the exit for them. Now David's tunnel is not an option anymore, so the command council decided to stop working on it and focus their efforts on the last tunnel, Harry's tunnel, and decided to use David's tunnel as a space where they could get rid of the soil they extracted from Harry's tunnel. All the work and effort were on Harry, and this is supposed to speed up the process more. The first thing they did was install the ventilation system. The prisoners extended a ventilation pipe made of milk cans. They attached these cans and extended them along the tunnel. And to pump the air, they used bags they had. They made something like a primitive machine that consisted of several bags and placed them at the beginning of the tunnel and there was a person working on pumping the air from these bags to the pipe they made. The second thing is the transportation system. The prisoners built a railway and put a trolley or a wooden cart on top of it. They used this system to transport the diggers and move the dirt through the tunnel, because the more they dug, the longer the tunnel increased. 
The tunnel was relatively narrow, and moving inside was difficult. If the diggers kept removing the dirt and crawling along it, the tunnel would not be finished. The final length of this tunnel will reach more than 100 meters, so this railway system was essential for them to be able to work quickly. The third thing is the lighting system. The prisoners made a lighting system in the tunnel by stealing some of the electric cables from workers who were working in the prison. Of course, the workers did not tell the guards that the cables were stolen because they knew that they would be punished. So the prisoners used these cables and stole some lamps from different places in the prison, and they managed to connect the cables to the electrical system of the prison. And they were able to make an excellent lighting system that extends all along the tunnel. Literally, we are talking about great work and planning. This is what happens when you are surrounded by an experienced team in various fields. Even with simple resources, you can achieve great things. Now the work on the tunnel is almost over. There was nothing left, so they had to prepare for what happened after the escape. They began to create forged identities and documents. They had in the team professional forgers of official documents. These forgers began to create new papers and identities for all the prisoners who were getting ready to escape, so that when they went out, they would be able, for example, to ride means of transportation, such as trains, without any problem. But one of the things that hindered them in this aspect was the issue of pictures. Because official documents and identities require pictures, their photos were with the prison administration, and the guards were the only ones who could get these photos. In this case, the prisoners resorted to blackmailing the guards. Some prisoners were skilled at pickpocketing. For example, they would go after one of the guards and take a card, key, or anything important from him. Then a second prisoner would come and say to him, My friend, I heard you lost your card. The guard would say, Yes, that's right. How did you know? You know where it is. And the prisoner would tell him, Look, we know that if we tell the commander that you lost your card, he will send you to the front lines, won't he? The guard will say, no, please, do not tell him, please. And the prisoner says, don't be afraid, calm down, and don't be nervous. We just want a few simple things from you. And then they ask him, for example, for pictures, a stamp, or any other things that may help them in forging documents. And the guard does not think much about the matter because, in the end, these pictures and seals will certainly not let them out of prison. So he turns a blind eye in exchange for not being exposed and being sent to the front lines. In this way, the prisoners were able to obtain everything they needed to complete the forging of their documents and identities. Finally, in March 1944, after more than a year of planning and continuous work, the work on the tunnel was completed. Everything was ready to implement the escape plan. All they needed now was the appropriate opportunity, especially in terms of weather. They did not want to go out on a night when the moon was full, for example and they were even hoping that they would escape on a rainy night, but it didn't rain. So they focused on going out on a night that was at the beginning of the lunar cycle, meaning the moonlight would be as little as possible. On March 24, 1944, the command council decided that this was the night of the escape. All the prisoners who were planning to escape from prison had to leave their huts and head to Hutno, 104, which is the hut under which Harry's tunnel was located. The command council had a list of these prisoners, and they were checking everyone who entered the hut. And this operation, of course, was being carried out slowly. Not all the prisoners came directly to the hut. They came in groups so as not to arouse suspicion. The prisoners began to descend, one by one from the tunnel, and crawl through it until they reached the end. But at the end of the tunnel, in reality, there was no exit. Roger decided that they would not dig the exit until the moment of escape, because if they opened the exit hatch early, one of the guards might be walking around and notice it, so they decided that they wouldn't open the exit until the night of the escape. The prisoners that were on the front lines reached the end of the tunnel, which was dug to the top, and they had already placed a ladder there. But at the top, a bad surprise was waiting for them. They discovered that their calculations were wrong. The opening of the tunnel did not reach the trees in the forest. They were outside of the prison, but the place they were in was open and was only about 50 meters away from the prison fence and the watchtowers. So there was a high probability that if they came out of this exit, 
the armed guards would see them and shoot them immediately. The members of the command council, who were at the front, decided to complete the escape. There was no time or opportunity to back out. Then the prisoners started to come out of the tunnel, one after another. The process was very slow, and there were many problems they encountered that night. There was a power outage, which darkened the tunnel, and there were many problems. Part of the tunnel collapsed, and it took time to be repaired. Several unexpected things happened. The process of extracting the prisoners from the tunnel was exhausting and took a long time. It took 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. M. The problem is that at 5 o'clock, the sun began to rise, and the prisoners were still coming out of the tunnel. Until 5 in the morning, 76 prisoners emerged from this tunnel and spread out in different directions and parts of the forest. After 5 o'clock, three additional prisoners also came out, but these three prisoners were noticed by the guards, so they moved with their weapons to besiege the tunnel opening. The last three prisoners raised their hands, surrendered to the guards, and were arrested again. As for the rest of the prisoners who were following them in the tunnel and wanted to get out, they tried to retreat inside the prison after they learned that the plan had been exposed. In the end, out of the 200 prisoners who were planning to escape, only 76 made it. But 76 is still a large number. Unfortunately, despite this, most of these prisoners were arrested within less than 72 hours. And most of them were only a few kilometers away from the prison. Some of the prisoners were able to escape completely and were able to return to their countries and participate in the war. But the rest of the prisoners were not so lucky, including Roger Bushel himself, the leader of this escape operation. Roger tried to board one of the trains using his fake identity, but the soldiers discovered him due to the strict inspection procedures after the escape operation, and they managed to arrest him. Prisoners of war, according to all international and humanitarian treaties, are supposed to be treated humanely. They may be punished sometimes, but no one expects them to be executed. Even these prisoners, when they escaped or tried to escape before, weren't executed and were transferred to a stronger prison. The problem is that this time they escaped from the strongest prison, so Hitler himself was very angry about what had happened, and the first thing that came to his mind was to go to that prison and execute all the prisoners, and then strip all the guards and responsible commanders of their positions and punish them. But in the end, his aides convinced him to only execute 50, the 50 that were caught after they escaped. Hitler himself supervised their execution, or he even executed them by hand. To this extent, he was angry about what these prisoners had done. Although the end was not as happy as what the prisoners had hoped for, at least Roger's plan succeeded in that it dispersed the focus of the German forces and their leadership, and many of their forces and efforts were directed toward dealing with this huge escape operation. The distraction plan succeeded, and Roger Bushel even died in relief because he knew that the goal of his plan was finally achieved. Here we have reached the end of our story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to support us with a like. And if you're not a subscriber yet, subscribe now and hit the bell icon.